weird. Have you won twice? Who knows? I know. I, I need to get better at audio. Um, it's it's still massively confusing to me. Um, not intuitive at all. Um, so I can hear two of myself now. So it's kind of weird to be able to have a conversation. Um, so I hope I'm sounding all right to everyone else. Uh, anyway, we are live, everyone. We're live with Brain Food Live on air. It is episode 62. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and welcome, everybody, to the show. Um, as ever, we want to start off with a bit of a sound check. Um, so everyone on Crowdcast, if you can hear me, just say hello. Just make sure on the chat stream you can hear me okay. Um, we are multi casting everyone to Facebook Live, LinkedIn, Periscope, all kinds of places like that. So wherever you are, can you just comment on uh, whatever platform you're watching this on and just say, hey, Hong, I can hear you. It's fine. Get on with the show. Okay. I think we're pretty good in most places. Um, Facebook, can you hear me? Um, just make sure you comment on that. Um, I think that's live. I think LinkedIn is live. And I think Periscope is live. Okay, I think we're good. Um, all right, everybody. I'm super excited today because we've got um, a great show ahead. Um, and one of the one of my most favorite people in recruitment, I have to say. Um, uh, this is going to be exciting for me because I haven't spoke to this guy for a long time. Um, and um, these days, I don't see much uh, of him, I'm afraid to say. So I'm delighted to see and speak and learn from him a little bit later. Um, but first, it's Adam Gordon. <laughs> I, was, I thought you were talking about me. Of course not, mate. Um, Adam, it's the great to have you back on the show. Um, oh, Christ, before I continue, I should also give a shout out to our sponsors this week, uh, which is Seen by Indeed, um, which sadly are going to sunset their platform later on this year. Um, but they're still going, I think up until July. Um, so you've got about another four weeks to get some good stuff out of Seen by Indeed. Make sure you go ahead and do that. Um, but yeah, check them out before they go. Um, I anyway, add, I just to add something to that. I was on a rep tech meetup um, about <clears throat> two or three nights ago, and there was a whole bunch of people on that saying, yeah, I've got great success from Seen by Indeed. There was a lot of people talking about the hires they'd made. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's a disconnect between... Um, yep. There's a disconnect between user value and uh, something that's worth doing by the actual you know organization behind it. Um, so it's a shame that that's going if it was uh, really a good good product. But you know what? It, this is it's kind of that's quite a consistent pattern with some of these bigger companies. Um, you know, Google's quite famous for this on their side, where they got product that a lot of people love and they get on with it and all the rest of it, and then decide to kill it um and yeah. everyone's up in arms and it's yeah. like why did you get rid of it did it really cost you that money yeah bizarre well, later. um well anyway um uh, that's good to know and a bit of feedback for if anybody at indeed is watching <laughs> we, we're gonna miss seeing by indeed um so bring that back in some form i would say Anyway, um, Adam Gordon, um, uh, great to have you back on the show. And you're, you're, you're set for the next four weeks, I think. So this is great to have you back. Um, and as ever, we always go through um, uh, sort of recruiting brain food the week before. What was interesting? Um, uh, anything in particular you want to talk about, Adam? Yeah, first of all, happy birthday a couple of days ago. Thank you very much. Did you make a cake? I did. I made two. Yeah, what um, both absolute disasters had to throw them both out um they were at the point they were inedible so learn one lesson here with baking you can't eyeball it you have to weigh the stuff out and you have to obey the instructions whereas for me i'm always like yeah i know what i'm doing nonsense um yeah. you have to to the to the minute to the degree to the gram baking it's a science, not an art. Well, yeah, it's a bit like sourcing. Follow, yeah, follow well, the rules. It. I mean, we talk about we'll talk about that with Glenn in a bit. Uh, is it an art or a science? Maybe a bit of both. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so listen, let's talk about some of the <clears throat> some of my favorite things in the brain food on Sunday. Um, the first one uh, was uh, well, it is a sourcing thing. So let's just do this first, and then and then get the others, and then get Glenn on sourcing on TikTok. Um, mm. 
yeah, here's some of the things you should do. Look at the people's uh, user profiles, uh, profile pictures. People tend to use their own picture on there, so you can do a Google reverse image search and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, TikTok is definitely not got content that I'm interested in. However, um, it is a great place for for sourcing the looks of things. Uh, you know what? Bellingcat, if people who don't know Bellingcat, they should check it out. If you're interested in sourcing, oh my goodness, uh, you totally need to get all over it. Bellingcat actually became famous during the Syrian civil war. Um, of course, the war's still going, but when it started kicking off in 2015, something like that, uh, this dude, I think he's a British guy, basically started doing this type of forensic research on YouTube, trying to track down what was fake news and what wasn't. Um, and purely with public data, he was able to piece together some incredible sort of evidence to point out, okay, yeah, there were chemical weapons here, or no, they weren't, or whatever. Um, and his investigative approach um, has since morphed into this OSINT type of thing uh, called Bellingcat, which is Open Source Investigations, I think it stands for. Um, and of course, that's directly linked to, to recruiting and sourcing methods. Um, although I think it goes several sort of levels beyond what a normal source would um because these people are basically fact finders fact checkers um you know people who might even be doing criminal investigations and stuff like that so um so that would be something to check out anyway they've written a guide on tiktok uh i think one of the first guides of this type on tiktok so by all means absolutely check it out i've just shared it in the link there for folks uh to check out on the chat stream okay what else uh, adam I just want to add a couple of interesting aspects to this, and not everybody knows, but um, TikTok was acquired by a Chinese company, ByteDance, a couple of years, right. years ago. Yep. And um, so, you know, if you're in America in particular, I wouldn't get hooked on using TikTok for sourcing because uh, the chances of it getting withdrawn from, from usage um, are pretty high. Um, There's a risk, but one thing I didn't know until I reached the shit later is actually TikTok and the Chinese version are two separate apps. Um, architecturally two separate apps and also branded separately. Um, so it could be that they're able to say, hey, this is a non-Chinese app, even though ByteDance is a Chinese company. Um, so that I didn't know, but the, basically sure. the, the two things are separate. Okay, so um, ByteDance's biggest product is a completely different thing called Tao Tiao, I think it's called, which is, uh, yep, it's news and news and content distribution. Uh, and news and information, you know, comes up based on its popularity, goes down. Spelled T O U T A O. Glenn, don't worry about that. We're going to invite you on soon. So what will happen is that there'll be a pop up on screen. It'll say, "Hey, accept that." So we, I have not invited you yet, Glenn. So don't worry about that. Um, just, uh, just be ready. We'll get you on in a couple of minutes. Don't worry about it. Yeah, Kautia, That's what it's called. That's Bite Dancer's main main kind of product. Right. This company was set up in 2012 and has a market mm -hmm. valuation over over 100 billion today, eight years yeah, later. Yeah, pretty incredible. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. I, I need to get into it. TikTok's one of those that downloaded it, couldn't figure it out, bailed out on it. Probably the same thing with uh, with Snapchat. So I think I, I, I've, I can age myself now. Like there's certain types of apps that literally I can't grok. Um, and I stopped at Instagram basically. That's it. I couldn't go further. Uh, but obviously, I need to because this is something that is happening and it's still the rocket ship that's going forward. Everyone's TikToking away. We need to figure this out as recruiters, you know? This is true. Although you mentioned Snapchat, and I think Snapchat's chat has just played a really big move, which is uh, a good move, which is it's um, taken Donald Trump out of its uh, discovery um module whereby that recommends content to people because uh, in in their words um he promotes racism and violence not not we not it looks like it they just say he promotes racism and violence so the only people that will see uh, donald trump um uh posts on snapchat anymore are the people that are following him uh, yeah so i think that that's a big move and that's one that could take uh people away from some of the other competitive platforms yeah on that note folks i mean firstly i think snapchat are absolutely correct he is clearly a racist i failed to see how anybody could say anything other than that by all means defend donald trump and be a racist step up and say it you know agree with him if you want but don't deny the fact of the matter that that is what he is um secondly what do you think by the way folks what do you think of social media platforms 
taking these types of decisions? Lots of controversy on it. Are you a Jack Dorsey person? Do you agree that you should flag up inaccuracies, even if it is the president of the United States? Or are you a Mark Zuckerberg person who says, hey, listen, any kind of amendments to a tweet or a message is editorializing, and I don't want to do that. Um, or do you go as far as Snapchat and say, okay, we're just going to bang you off uh, the, the recommendation system, and if you want to follow, you can follow. Um, so I'd really be interested in what's happening in terms of your opinions on this. Um, yeah, ping me an opinion. Are you Zuckerberg or are you are you Dorsey on this? It'd be great to see actually on the various platforms we're on. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Crowdcast now to figure out which side people are on on this. That would be really interesting. Okay. Was, um, the reason I got onto that was because you mentioned about Instagram. And, of course, Instagram is owned by Snap, but owned by um, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, now that's really where I was going with Snapchat. Might well be, might well get some, uh, you know, audience moving from other places. And I was specifically thinking about uh, about Instagram. The other thing you know, about Twitter, if you if you if you put the word Twitter, if you put the word racist into uh, the search bar on Twitter, and then select people, go and have a look at who comes up first. You probably won't be surprised, but it's pretty interesting. Clearly, yeah, clearly, um, interesting times. You know what? All these tech companies, which everyone who follows me, certainly on Facebook, knows I'm a big defender of, of big tech in general. And my overall posture is closer to Zuckerberg. I've got to be honest. I think you kind of got to stay as neutral as you can. Um, because Not because I in any way agree with Donald Trump, um, but because if you start sort of editorializing it, you do land yourself in a position where you're going to be inconsistently applying those rules. And the accusation that you're being inconsistent will be rightfully level, leveled at you, uh, which is what Dorsey's going to encounter. Um, so anyway, we'll wait and see how that goes. I think basically my, I'm a heart and mind type scenario. My heart is with Dorsey and my head's with Zuckerberg on it. But I'd love to see what everyone else thinks uh, on this matter. All right. What else is going on, uh, Adam? Yeah. One more. Yeah, well, actually, three, but they're quick. A couple more. Right. Yeah, go on. Two two them two up, the yeah. Link. Right. The first one is this, this concept of people feeling weightlessness because they're working from home and they've got nowhere to go, they can't go right. to the office, and mm -hmm. they're feeling a pull towards a physical location being the office. Yep. This is um, uh, something that I think is really important because it's part of an, we're, we're, we're a sort of headquarters or the origination, the genesis of an organization is to an extent part of its brand and part of its employer brand. And so um, I, I think that it, there, there is definitely a case to be having some kind of physical mecca. Yep. Yep. That's a really important post. I've just shared it again in the chat stream. I think a guy called Neil Usher, one of the some some LinkedIn posts are really good on this. But he he is basically defending the idea of a co-located company. Um, and he's talking about something like the a gravity of the business. Like if there's a HQ, there's the infrastructure there, the C level is there, the operation. If you like, if you imagine a business as a as an entity, is like this is where the heart and soul of the business is. Um, and if you're all distributed, there is no HQ. Do you lose something of the soul of a business? And I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it. And like I say, even as a remote advocate. Um, I've got a lot of sympathy with that view. Um, I think that's a really good argument. Um, uh, so check that post out, folks. Um, okay, what else, uh, Adam? Two, two more, two quick ones. They're both um, sort of um, economic. Uh, Spain's moving towards a kind of universal basic income. Yeah. And Swiss companies have uh, been told that they need to pay people uh, if they are going to work, if they're making the work from home, pay, pay towards their rent. That's the two. They're both interesting global um, trends, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Super interesting. So for people who don't know, I think all of us are, know a little bit more about UBI than we ever did before, right? I mean, before this pandemic occurred, what the hell was UBI? Maybe some sort of utopian uh, sort of experiment uh, that some commune in Helsinki was doing. But now everyone's talking about it. Governments are rolling it out because they realize, actually, it might be more economically efficient to just pay people a guaranteed stipend every month to make sure wages and rent and all that type of stuff is being paid rather than have those folks lose their jobs, stop paying rent and get on out on the streets and, li and, and literally um, be removed from a consumer economy because they don't have any liquidity. Um, so Spain looked like they're maybe the first country 
um, to actually go proper UBI, UBI to use, universal and unconditional. Um, so this is not means tested. This is everybody gets it. And everybody means everyone. Um, uh, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. It means everyone over a certain age gets this stipend as a citizen of the country. Very important experiment and the reason why uh, it needs to be that way and not means tested. Two reasons why, by the way. The administration of means testing people often is counterproductive. It takes too much effort and energy to actually test people to figure out whether they deserve it or not. You might as well just give them the money. It's cheaper. Um, and the second part of it is that it removes any sort of stigma about people receiving this uh, incentive. Um, and it kind of removes the poverty trap concept in the sense people should still be motivated to work because everyone is actually getting the same amount of money. Anyway, that's a really interesting one. Do check it out. And by the way, Swiss friends, any of our Swiss friends watching this, I'd love for you to confirm what I read in the article um, that Adam was referring to. There's a court of law in Switzerland, the highest court of law in Switzerland, outside of the EU, by the way. Um, so the highest court of law in Switzerland basically rule that companies that were instructing their staff to work from home had to pay a portion of that person's rent because they're using their home space to do work. Um, and I just thought, wow, there's, COVID doesn't stop surprising me, right? And it, always these, these second order effects occur and suddenly you see this thing happen. You think, that's weird. But then I realized, hang on, the logic is there because you are repurposing your home for an office. I have. I don't know whether you, you know, you, we're, we're suddenly carving out space uh, that we didn't have before. I see people online saying, yeah, I just bought a new desk. I've just, you know, changed my garage into this, that, and the other. You know, why shouldn't companies offer some support to that? Um, it's not something that employers should necessarily do all off their own back. So anyway, fascinating couple of, stuff. Couple of couple of interesting additional points to that are. Um, it doesn't apply to people who choose to work from home. It's only if you're told you're working from home. And then the second is, um, I, it didn't mention anything about if you've got a mortgage. So if you own your own, if you own your own house, it was it was only the word rent was the only one that was included. I mean, it, I don't know. Does everybody in does everybody in Switzerland rent like they do in Germany? I'm not sure. I think they probably do because because I'm just thinking Switzerland's so damn expensive. Um, uh, even even with Swiss salaries, everything is just like ch -ch -ch, times ten what you might expect. Uh, so, yeah, we need some Swiss people to tell us whether this is true or not. The mythology of Switzerland. Um, we're just speculating here. Um, anyway, some really good stuff. And I, I, I really hope people kind of enjoy some of this more society feeling content that I put into Brain Food now and again, rather than just like the macro task based stuff. Um, because, you know, recruitment is not in isolation of the wider things in society. It's, it's, it's absolutely embedded part of it. And we've actually got a big role to play. Um, in many respects. I mean, we will hopefully get to talk about diversity with Glenn a little bit, little bit later, but obviously massive topic um, over the last two weeks or more. So again, recruiters may and HR people may have a unique uh, uh, position to play on all of that. Anyway, um, Adam, we're going to move on because yep. as interesting as you and I are, um, people did not tune in um, in order to pay attention to us, um, uh, but they tuned in in order to see uh, and hear from Glenn Cathy, um, who uh, I have actually lost on this thing. So let me see if I can find him. Um, oh, I wonder whether he's actually disappeared on us. Oh, there he is. No, got him. There we go. Let's see if I can invite him in. Glenn, I've just invited you on. You should get uh, some sort of notification and you just click yes on that and cross fingers. We'll get you on screen, my friend. So just while we're waiting for Glenn to join, or just as he's joining, um, I'm posting a question in the chat here. I'm going to ask Glenn this question, but I want everybody else's um, opinion on, on, on the answer. And the question is, is, is sourcing going to be more or less fruitful because so many jobs are going work from home? And um, I think this is something that's going to be very interesting for sourcing yeah. in general. 100%. I mean, I think there's been a huge change um, it, it systemically uh, for us. So I'd, I'd be really interested to see what people think about that um, when we, we discuss it. Um, and by the way, if anybody does have any questions they want to ask as well, please ask it in the ask a question function at the bottom of your screen. That's where we're going to get to those questions and we'll be able to, to handle it. So you've got questions for Glenn or anybody else, please ask them there. Glenn, Kathy's on screen. Glenn, how are you doing? You're looking well. Great thank to you, see you, thank man. Thank you. Yeah, doing good. Thanks for having me on. 
Great. Um, and Glenn, I don't know whether you've met Adam before, but Adam Gordon is co-host of uh, Brain Food Live on Air. Uh, Hi, a good friend of mine also, so please meet each other there. Um, Glenn, uh, for the few people who don't know you, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself, who you are, and what do you do? <clears throat> sure. Uh, quickly. I don't really like talking about myself so much, uh, but I, I started in recruiting over 20 years ago uh, as an IT recruiter in Virginia at a, at a small staffing firm. And I eventually moved my way up the ladder uh, into leadership positions. And uh, I think I attended the second SourceCon, which inspired me to start blogging all the way back in 2008. Uh, so some people may be aware of my blog, although I have not been writing for the past couple of years. I've just been really busy on the family side. But I'm currently uh, working at Ronstad in our digital factory, so I'm the head of digital strategy. So I'm focused on a number of things from all manner of technology that enables uh, our business, which is, of course, focused on uh, finding and placing great talent. That's amazing. And Glenn Cathy, um, by the way, I've just shared Glenn's LinkedIn um, on the chat stream, so uh, do follow Glenn on there. And also BooleanBlackBelt.com is the blog i think it's still a legendary blog even though as you mentioned glenn you've not been able to uh to, to be as current with it as as perhaps you, as, as ideal but it still contains like super relevant stuff i read stuff on there that's like from 2012 which is now like eight nine years ago and it's still like wow this yep. is like still relevant um so wonderful to have you on the show glenn um let's deal with some of these questions i mean sourcing it seemed to me at the beginning of this year, sourcing was still the most in-demand thing ever. Um, everyone was talking about this. I see it on Brain Food. Whenever I put a sourcing article on there, the clicks shoot up to the top. Everyone's interested in it. Um, how do you think COVID-19, pandemic, remote sort of work from home, and also this huge economic recession that we're all seeing, candidate rich market now, how does this impact um, sourcing in general, just as it gives a big overview on it, um, Glenn, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, that's a massive question with so many tunnels you can go down. Um, I will say certainly, and it, and it goes back to the question that was posed earlier, um, for roles like knowledge worker roles where working from home or working remotely is a possibility, a very real possibility, it's certainly going to equalize and make sourcers jobs a little bit easier than before. Right. I can't tell you how many times I've been looking for a particular role and I'm like, wow, if I could just look in some other locations, uh, if you could just open up the location working with the hiring manager. And and now I'm I'm sensing that you're able to do that uh, more again with knowledge workers specifically. And that, that's been my focus in my career is, again, we're on the high end professional side in I.T. Uh, there's already been, I guess, a move towards remote work even before COVID-19. But this has obviously been uh, a massive, massive shift. Um, so I, I think it does, I, I never like to say easier, uh, but certainly it's all about supply and demand. And like you said, you, you have unemployment in certain countries, uh, but that's completely variable by country and also by type of sector. So what we're seeing here in the U.S. is that the, like an IT will focus on is not as impacted. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting because I do talk to some people that think the supply uh, is going to somehow increase, right? And uh in fact, right now, there's some people that are saying, I don't really want to make a change in my job. I'm happy to have the job that I have. Changing uh, a job in this type of environment is particularly scary. So many people are trying to stay put. So on the opposite side of that, if you're trying to recruit like passive uh, knowledge workers, you might have a harder time convincing someone to make a change from what they have now, which is it could be relative safety to moving into the unknown. And then flipping to the other side of the coin again, though, this is an unprecedented opportunity to, to start getting some, some great talent that may be available, either because of furloughs, layoffs, things along those lines, reduction in force, those types of things, um, or even just uh, the environment itself. So I think great companies, even if they're reducing, are hopefully thinking very strategically in terms of how they might be able to bring on some additional uh, top talent that they may not have been able to uh, bring on otherwise. Yeah, you know what? On that final point, Glenn, I mean, thank you for, the, for that big answer. I realized how big that question was and probably I, I definitely need to break it down. But it is a case where there's like lots of conflicting 
um, there's tensions as every trend there is a counter trend um, and how we swim and navigate across that is very interesting the final point though I just want to pick up on that I think is super relevant um, maybe companies don't need to think about are you growing or are you shrinking um, but even if you are overall cutting staff now is the time to actually hire some strategic talent um, that you might otherwise have really struggled to, to, to go for um, there's a really good bit of practical advice. I forget who wrote the blog, but it was a case of, hey, listen, you have to cut staff. I get it. But what a recruiter should be doing is speaking to your hiring manager and saying, hey, what are the last uh, of the last three years? Give me the name of two people who you really wanted to hire that we weren't able to get um, because I'm going to reach out to them. Um, and now is the time to just drop them a line and say, hey, listen, um, uh, how is things going? Just wanted to touch base because you never know. Uh, right. Maybe they're on furlough. Maybe they're also now disturbed in whatever reason, because this is a crazy, unprecedented environment. It could give your business an unprecedented opportunity to actually hire that person, which uh, previously you wouldn't have the chance to. Mm -hmm. um, keep the cat in the shot, Adam. Man, we need to have that. That's uh, you know, that's going to improve the experience for the viewers. I think. Um, okay, so. Um, in terms of the, uh, so we had a bunch of things that we wanted to deal with here, Glenn, particularly, um, you know, sourcing as a, as a discipline. I don't know if you saw my post earlier today on LinkedIn, but I thought, you know what, um, you were one of the very first people um, that actually introduced the concept of, oh, we've lost Glenn's video there, I don't know why, um, maybe he's gone completely. I think he probably has. Um, but no, we'll I'm see still here. Him. Are you there? Okay, great. Yeah um uh, hopefully the video will come back in a sec um but glenn you were one of the first people to really distinguish sourcing from recruitment as a kind of a sub discipline within the wider rubric of recruitment different types of people different types of skills more research more finders of people and so on and i think over the years that distinction has been established in the sense that you know you see sort of sourcing conferences sourcing events even sourcing businesses um, set up that, you know, don't pretend to be recruitment. Um, do you think, though, that that situation might be coming to, that era might be coming to an end in a way? Um, because do sources need to get better at the engagement aspect of it and kind of bend back into recruitment a little bit, um, given the fact that perhaps, you know, delivery of candidate data uh, may no longer be uh, the only thing of value these days? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's always an interesting question for me because you could, you could argue that engagement has always been important, but that, that begs the question or even the definition of what do you consider sourcing? And, uh, you know, it's 2020 and I would say that you have uh, many people uh, that are considered to be, you know, I guess, uh, you know, experts in their space that have differing thoughts on what exactly is sourcing. You still have some people saying sourcing is just the finding. You have some people that say it's also finding and engaging. Um, I'll unpack that in a moment. And then you even have some folks like Balash or like, hey, at one point he was even saying, well, why isn't uh, inbound sourcing as well? You know, you're, you're attracting as well. It's not just the outbound. Whereas I've always felt that it's the outbound effort that's really the true sourcing. Uh, but I can see the arguments every single way. So I, I, would, I have to first say, if somebody says there's only one, this is the true definition, they're wrong. Uh, the reality is it's, it's open to interpretation. And I think it's really important to focus on what are we sourcing? Are you sourcing names? If so, you don't need to engage people. If you're performing competitive intelligence and you don't, you don't have to call anybody, again, you could say I'm, I'm a sourcer. But if you're sourcing candidates, you have to be engaging people to know that they actually are a candidate. To find somebody is one thing. To find them and find out that, yes, I think we can actually get this person. They're at least open to having an additional conversation. You can say I've sourced a candidate, not just I've sourced this person's information. And I, I've actually always, even though my blog focused for like 10 years on the finding part, it's really funny. I did start to say, hey, I'm, I'm, it's not that I get tired of talking about uh, the finding part, but there's so many other people in the space. And like, I, I want to talk about something else, you know, something I think is is not more interesting, but just as interesting, which is that the, psycholo the psychology of sourcing. Right. Uh, so I've written a little bit about that, spoke a little bit about that. Uh, going right back to your question, though, but I think it still begs the question, how do you define sourcing? You know, what are you actually doing in your job? Uh, engagement will always be important. 
Absolutely. Especially if you're, if you're required to say, we have people that are trying to find the best of people who are not finding us. I, that's where I kind of take a position and say, look, you know, if you post jobs, you have really good employer branding, you've got a pipeline of people coming in and you're sorting those people. You're not really recruiting them in the sense of the verb recruitment because they've already shown up at your door and said, I'd like to come in. For me, sourcing a candidate is also kind of tied into recruitment and saying, you're reaching out to someone that was not even looking for a position sometimes, let alone thinking of your company. And you convert them to someone who's like, you know, I really wasn't looking to make a change, but what you just approached me with, that's something I want to learn more about. I would argue that is a sourced candidate. And that definitely takes uh, skill in terms of understanding how to appropriately engage, reach out to, and even get a response in the first place. Because that's another interesting skill, right? There's the finding, then there's the engagement. How do I even get them to respond? And then there's the third phase, which is how do I handle that conversation? And some people I know listening in, I get a smile when I say this. I really enjoy talking to somebody who is like, no, no, thanks. I'm, I'm not looking. By the end of the conversation, you're like, wow, I'm really excited about <laughs> exploring opportunities right, with this company because that's amazing. Right? This person was just going to work every day. Things are okay, but they actually realize, yeah, there's a gap between where I am and where I want to go. And this may be an opportunity to help me take the next step in my career. I mean, I don't know. I still like, what's better than that? Waking somebody up to saying, you know, I was okay, but I want to be better. And maybe this is an opportunity for me to explore to be better. To me, that is sourcing candidates. Yeah, I think, you know what, you, to to classify the person, as you say, names versus candidates, maybe the, the, the one thing that would help actually solve any of these disputes. I often think, you know, people who have arguments in, so, in the sourcing world, including myself, you know, I get involved in some of these debates. Um, oftentimes we're, we're talking about the wrong outputs. Um, and, you know, if we don't agree on what outputs we're talking about, i.e., look, I've got a live candidate that is speaking to me, uh, therefore I've sourced that candidate. Um, I think that makes much more sense than to say, um, uh, you, you know, argue the debate to say, uh, you know, whether this is a person uh, technically have, a, have I sourced them or attracted them or whatever it might be. Um, so it's interesting because I think the debate on whether sourcing will be more important or less important as we go to this post-COVID world needs to factor in what it is we mean by the output. Um, uh, you know, um, if we talk about names, Jen purely, probably it will recede a little bit um, given the fact that there's going to be, I think, more candidates being uh, uh, sort of around. I think freer with their data as well. I've noticed that occurring. Mm -hmm. A lot more. I don't know whether you noticed, Glenn, but lots more emails available now. Lots more, lots more phone numbers, even. <laughs> like we've all seen the layoff lists and stuff like that, yep. haven't we? Um, so, you know, three months ago, stuff. Even six months ago, let's say, uh, where uh, a developer's contact details would be absolutely sacrosanct. You know, you need to put effort and energy into extract that. Now it may well be on a spreadsheet that's open for anybody to have a look at. So, um, uh, super interesting to see. Uh, how you know the, the shift to the value of data uh, mm -hmm. will be as we go. Um, Glenn, you mentioned actually part of your job is actually to to look at the technology side also, um, the, the evaluation of this. So a quick question on this, and this is actually a question asked by Ivan Harrison. Um, so let's just jump straight into that. Um, Ivan says, "What tech talent? What what talent tech product should I say?" has rendered you speechless in 2020. Um, uh, so it's a typical I I, Ivan way of framing it, isn't it? It is yeah. an Ivan way of framing it. Um, but I think it's a decent question. So Glenn, let me just throw it straight at you. Um, have you encountered anything in your uh, sort of role in Randstad um, that would that was, that, that you stopped, you to, uh, stopped you in your tracks and you thought, hey, this may be the thing? Wow, I mean, that is a, a very interesting way to frame the question. Um, I, I have to start, I have to begin my answer with saying that I actually, I love technology, but I, I approach everything with a healthy dose of skepticism uh, because you have to realize that companies are selling a product, right? And not all products actually do everything that they're sold or as well, or they're, you know, obviously the, there's the hope, the emotional, I hope this is going to solve my problems type of thing. The reality is tools seldom themselves solve the problems. Having said that, um, 
I would say one of the most interesting, and it didn't just come onto the scene in, in 2020, although it's had really good success, I think, this year specifically, is Eightfold, Eightfold AI. Mm -hmm. um, as, as kind of a total platform, um, also because they, they look specifically at um, bias and inclusion. You know, they have like blind uh, type of sourcing capability. Um, mm -hmm. It's also very interesting because, and they're not the only player in this space, but to me, it's the the total package. One of the things uh, that they also focus on is internal mobility, right? Mm -hmm. So it goes back to if I, as a company, am looking to hire somebody, why am I looking outside first? You should actually be looking first internally with people who've already done a good job for you to figure out, is there somebody in my organization somewhere that is the best fit for this role before going outside? So I think the internal mobility piece is important. Although it has a, the external sourcing capability, I really like the idea of uh, prioritizing uh, people who have already done a good job for you, right? I think you should, be, you should be promoting from within and allowing people to explore career paths before you start inviting people in. No offense to people on the outside, right? But if you're one of those employees, you're thinking the same thing, why, why me? Can't I well, do that role, yeah. 100%. I mean, a quick shout out firstly to A4. We do know those guys. They're actually one of our sponsors for the Bring Food Marathon last month. They were very generous in, in pushing out some of their, uh, rushing out some of their products to help us support on the marathon. Um, and I agree with you. They've got some very interesting kind of sweet uh, vision, if you like, for their product, uh, which is more than just acquisition at the front end. Um, and of course, in, in terms of in mobility, Adam, you and I have talked about this uh, multiple times. Uh, particularly in the context of COVID-19, where lots of companies are looking to redeploy rather than let go, and they're struggling to do it because guess what? They've been terrible at redeploying it in any context. So now that now that they've asked to accelerate it, they, they realize they, they've never had the ability to do it. So um, can you tell us why Eightfold supports this? And by the way, you know, we're not here to sell Eightfold in any way, shape, or form, but as we're using it as an example, why do you think their internal mobility solution uh, does have value. I mean, what does it do? Well, they have really good, well, I'd say this is just one element, but they appear to have very solid matching capability in terms of their, their algorithms. Um, they can also look at their career progressions. So they've looked at uh, almost an unimaginable data set to figure out how people have moved throughout their careers. And it can actually help people look at uh, those particular career paths and start to predict, well, you're similar to these people, somewhat similar. This could be another path within the company. Here's other people who have taken similar paths in the company uh, or their backgrounds are actually similar to you. So it can help kind of predictively make some recommendations uh, that way, like bi-directionally. Here's where you are. Where do you want to go? How can you get there? Here's people in the positions that you'd be interested in. How can you get there? Uh, who are the people that you can actually reach out to? Uh, to be able to try to make that happen. So for me, that to me is, is really important because like you were saying, interim mobility is, is, I mean, companies have it, they endorse it, but you have to think of also what's the experience. Do, do your employees have to run a search, a keyword search for jobs? Where do they even begin? What are they titled? If you're in a large organization, that's a particular challenge. It's yep. also challenging for companies because if they don't have the data on the skills of their workers, they don't even know, you know, because you can do it bi-directionally. You have the, the, the worker that's saying, I'd like to explore opportunities, but you also have the company just looking at its people and saying, you know, succession planning, where should we move people mm -hmm. uh, throughout the organization? But if you don't know what those people's skills are, then how are you going to identify who's potentially a good player to move from group A to group B? And again, with their deconstruction of people's work experience and also leveraging social media uh, data, they can have a, a more accurate uh, sense of what someone has done, but also what they're currently doing. And that's always interesting, right? To think that you might have a, a solution like Eightfold or even others that know more about your employees than, than you do, right? LinkedIn, in some cases, actually has more data on employees than, than the companies do. And that's a challenge. 
I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think or, or if, if we're honest with ourselves, you, you have to say that LinkedIn has stronger data set than, than we have on, on our own businesses, you know, yeah. because it's self-maintained data firstly. So people tend to update LinkedIn data much more frequently than they would uh, update whatever data you've got of them. Um, you, know, you might have a record of some type in your HRIS system, um, but it won't be as update, as updated as the behavior of someone on LinkedIn, let's say. Um, and they've got comprehensive data, uh, not only of the people you currently have, but the previous people who've worked there, career path type data, how people have, you know, tenure information, all that type of stuff. So it's, it is interesting point because it means that the, the, the intelligence is moving out of the business. If it was ever in the business, it's, it's actually aggregated across uh, on the vendor side, um, which, you know, hopefully that will mean some opportunities for vendors, you know, um, it, it could well be, this is the, the future role of a vendor to address at an ecosystem level um, rather than necessarily at a, at a at a company by company level, you know? Yeah, well, we, I we would also say, to, okay. go ahead, Adam. I was going to say, we, we definitely have to stop thinking about the external um, talent pipeline and, and specifically and think about the total talent pipeline and be considering internal people and external people for the same roles the, the minute the vacancy gets signed up. The, um, the there's I think there's the, we when we talked about this we had actually a, a particular episode on 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 internal mobility and we I should have really documented what the hell we talked about because I thought we solved the problem it's one of these Glenn where I think we solved the problem I failed to actually write it down and now I'm gonna have to rewatch the damn show again um, <laughs> but, but basically it was like okay we have a, a opacity problem like we don't know the skills um, we have. Uh, a, an experience problem, as you mentioned, Glenn, like what do you want the employee to do? Um, do you actually ex expect him to conduct an internal search? Because guess what? He or she may not be comfortable with doing that. Um, mm. He or she is not comfortable at work. What makes you think they're going to be comfortable accessing an internal system, doing a search that the company might be tracking? Um, yeah. You know, um, it could well be uh, you need to take that away. So this is where a matching product, I think, does come into play. Um, we have um, a political problem, a cultural problem, let's say, um, you know, turf wars between teams, hiring yeah. managers um, have uh, 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 incentives for maintenance of a team, not necessarily sharing resource. So we thought actually what you've got to do is take it away from the hiring manager completely. Uh, he's just a coach of a team. Uh, he gets what he's given um, and you move those people around. You have a different function that moves the people around. Um, so I think it was, was it Andrew Godowski. Do you know that guy? Um, mm -hmm. he had some decent ideas on this and so did Katrina Hutchinson O'Neill so I'm going to fish out that episode and share it with everyone here because I think it could be could well be relevant um, okay cool um, tell us some more about what is happening uh, in the sourcing world going forward um, uh, Glenn uh, as you see it I mean uh, I would guess that uh, Randstad has maybe tasked you with this to keep a little bit of around the corner type of uh, uh, thinking um, I believe Randstad uh, had previously set up sort of a sourcing groups of excellence, a department that, you know, keep on top of this type of activity. Where do you see sort of the future of the function uh, as we go forward as far as, you know, um, it, you know, it, particularly in context of COVID-19? I don't want to just bang on about it, but it seems to me uh, unavoidable um, and it, it's, it's an externality we've got to really factor into our thinking. Yeah, well... It, it, again, there's a lot going on there because it, depending on country, depending on business and or the type of talent for, you're going to have different um, of supply. Right? You may have a situation where you have more than enough people in, and so that becomes more of a screening and selection type of approach versus a scenario where you're not getting the right people applying to your position. So you have to be more strategic and saying, I'm going to go and try to bring it proactively, bring in. Uh, people. Technology certainly helps. Um, data and the ability to acquire and then leverage the data to make more informed decisions is important. I'd say uh, one area that we've been focused on for the past three or so years, and you know, I know it's, it's, I guess it's even beyond a buzzword now, but you know, chatbots have been a thing, but for a while, but I did a, a pretty massive evaluation of 15 chatbots back in 2017. And we've done a number of different, uh, essentially proofs of concept with different conventional user experiences and everybody it's easier to say chatbot but the reality is if you look at the applicant experience which 
you're, you're seeing an influx in uh, pools where you're, you're driving a lot more pipelines than before. If you already had kind of an applicant problem, it's been exaggerated in this edition. So what we're looking at is the companies are looking at the use of conversational experiences, improve the app experience. Instead of a form uh, on a mobile device, which is a horrible experience if you've ever actually tried to form on a mobile device, and you may not hear back, right? Also sad, it's 2020, we have a black hole, people don't hear back. Yeah, uh, Glenn, I'm afraid the, the, the line is chopping up a little bit for us there. So I think we've got most of what you're talking about, but definitely chatbots um, are going to be a, and they, they are already, I think they're they're pretty much mainstream. I, I, would, I would be surprised if you're, you know, a FTSE, one, uh, FTSE 500 business even uh, with any kind of TA team, uh, if you haven't already experimented with some sort of chatbot already, um, and as you say, um, you know the, uh, the 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 idea of being always on and always available um, uh, to provide uh, FAQ type functionality, I think, is is a, is a no brainer. Um, our friends at Jobpile actually have done some really good research on this in terms of how important it is to have an always on resource, particularly in times of stress. They actually had a uh, a survey, not a survey, they actually aggregated the data of candidate questions to the chatbots across their uh, across their uh, sort of deployments on industry sectors. Um, and it was no surprise to find that actually candidates were asking about COVID more than anything else. What was your COVID policy? Uh, how well are you positioned in relation to a recession? Um, imagine not being able to answer that question until your staff got back from furlough. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Your candidate is not right. going to be too impressed by your by your your positioning there. Uh, but you have a bot that might be able to instantly respond to you. Um, then that makes a, a big difference um, as well. Oh, by the way, I should also say Brain Food has a chat bot, um, and people are more than happy to try this out. Um, I actually made a mess up of this um on the you know, wouldn't be surprised uh, i made a mess up of this this weekend when i sent like double the double messages to everyone who's already subscribed to it so i do beg your pardon but if you want to play on the chat bot um i've just um put it in there in whatsapp just basically say hello to that number on whatsapp and you can chat to robo hung um and the idea is uh it's it's there to provide you with information that I would otherwise provide you as a human being, but you know what? This thing is going to be faster and and basically uh, be ready to help you. Um, can okay, we, go can, yeah. Can, can we can we ask uh, can we ask Glenn about Baz's question? So, um, oh. Glenn, Baz Baz van der Hatter has asked: um, Does Glenn believe that the search part of sourcing can be fully automated or almost fully automated? Okay, great question. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Are we good? Yep. So I would say that, that depends. It depends on, actually, yes, it can. But the, the, the answer has to be qualified by to, to what extent. You know, you, you can use Netflix today or Amazon and you can just use all the recommendations. You don't actually have to look for anything. So it technically works, right? Uh, you can automate matching for sure. Um, but I will tell you through extensive multi-year <laughs> multiple round evaluations of, of technology from anywhere from uh, basic keyword search, non-algorithmic to deep learning, multiple deep learning solutions. Um, no single query returns all of the best people. So even if you automate it, it works, right? And, and it's okay because that's what humans do anyway today. If you, if you run a search and you, you, you use that search, you, you've taken a slice of what's available and that's it. Um, if you use technology, you can do the same thing. It just takes a slice and says, here, look at these people. Um, I think what's missing from technology, from the automation piece, is the ability to re-query or re-ask the question and say, okay, so you've given me this slice of recommendations. I want to go back and say, let's look at it a little bit differently. Let's ask a different question of the database, which will return a different set of people. So to think that there's always going to be one single perfect ordered list out of any database, I think is ridiculous, but you can automate it. That doesn't necessarily mean you should, uh, or that's a bad thing. As long as you have the ability to go back and say, well, that was one, that's like a canned report. That's one of my best analogies. If you perform an automated search on a, a job or a match, it's like getting a canned report, like a, a standard report. 
And that's okay, but that's why there's report developers, right? Because you're like, well, actually, I want to look at the data a little bit differently. I have to be able to go back to re-query. Many of these solutions have a hard time with that because you get the match, that's what you have. You may apply some filters, but you don't really have a way to go back in and manipulate and say, I see what you've returned, but I need to look at the database in a slightly different way to return people that may have been buried by the initial query, which actually may be better people. Yeah, and, and you know what, Glenn, you've actually uh, kind of surfaced up a secondary problem here, which, which could also be significant. In the sense, if you do automate the search part, then presumably anyone who has the tool it will generate exactly the same results. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, literally, you've just got this automated thing getting all of these canned responses back, and you just end up really shrinking um, the overall talent base or the visible talent base, but everyone's looking at the same spot. Um, and one of the things I think you're exceptionally good at is thinking against this. Because one of the things I read on your blog that really uh, kind of struck me and it's always stay with me actually, Glenn, uh, was that you would actually get no competitive advantage by doing what everyone else does. Um, you know, if you did exactly the same as everyone else, if we just went on Netflix and just took exactly the same recommendations as everyone else, we'd literally have the same result. Um, and if you're a recruiter and you're competing for the talent, um, you're not going to get a, an advantage there. So tell us a little bit about this psychology. Like a lot of the things that you do very cleverly, Ben, uh, Glenn, is to think about how the candidate actually creates the data. For instance, one of the best things that you kind of introduced me to was the kind of deliberate misspelling that certain yeah. candidates use in order to throw recruiters off. Um, yeah. You know, they don't want to fight, be found by you. Therefore, they will describe their work, their, their job title with a deliberate error so that it doesn't come up on your search. Um, but they still want to be present on the, 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 the platform. So let's dive into that, the hidden candidate. Sure. Um, where did you find that psychology? How does it now apply to the modern world? Is that something you could pipe into a system uh, and automate in some way? Well, give us, give us your, your thinking on that, uh, Glenn. <laughs> you're, you're really good at like layering the question. I'm going to see if I can hit all four of those points. Uh, where, where it came from, um, I think like most people, we're products of our initial environment. And I think it's important uh, to, to draw that out because I know some people will think, hey, you know, what you've brought to, to the sourcing community is, is awesome. And I'm like, actually, I just, I, I learned what I learned a long time ago, which is still applicable today because I wanted to do well in my job and not get fired. I'll be perfectly honest. And I didn't start at Ronstadt, just for the record. Um, we had a small, a relatively small database in our metro area. I worked in the, the Washington DC area. We had 80,000 records in our database. I know to some companies that's large, but to other companies, that's really, really small. And I wasn't trained how to cold call people. I was literally brought in with a group of like six to eight people. If anybody on the calls listening has worked for a small staffing company, you know that mentality of hire a group of people, a few people figure it out. You know, it's like going to Thunderdome, you know, some people enter one person, in this case stays. Um, and I, I had to, I would run into blocks. I'm like, wow, I, I can't find any more people but that was unacceptable to me. Like I had to provide candidates to, to my clients. So it was literally that, that dynamic drove me to say, how can I rephrase the question? How can I rerun a search to find additional people that might be qualified? And it came to me that if, you know, it, initially you always want to search for the ideal words, right? And the ideal titles. But when you rent, when you get to the bottom of that and you still don't have your people, you can't just say I'm done. But it was interesting because I've worked with people who are like, well, there's nobody in the database. I'm like, actually, you can go back and ask a question that's mutually exclusive that actually brings back a completely new set of results by using like the not operator. But I love what you kind of keyed in on because it's still something that's relevant today, will always be relevant, and it will be a challenge for any AI and technology is the fact that people, whether they write a social media profile or a CV, they never put everything in their resume or CV or profile. The other challenge is that even if they try, they may forget some things. They're not professional CV writers. Uh, like you said, some people do it to be avoided. Uh, other people just don't know that they need to mention that particular thing in their resume, which means you simply can't return them. As soon as you search for a term, you exclude qualified people that actually have it, but just forgot to say it. 
And that to me has always been the big door opening in my mind of, wow, if I have to now think about the, the, the variability of how people might talk about their skills or not talk about their skills, that means I have to run several different passes at each database to continue to uncover each layer. And I love to tell the stories of me finding people that did not mention a skill I needed, they actually had it. And to be able to do that with technology, that's a challenge, right? Because it's it's a multi-pass type of approach. You know, it takes several different slices at the at the database. I think technology can certainly help. I'm not ever gonna say that it can't do that. I think we're a little ways away from it right now. And it would be great to talk to technology providers who want to try to solve that problem to say, great, you have it's it is a dialogue with a database, is the way that I like to think about it. You ask a question, do you have these people? We have these people, but do you have people that may not say it this way or just didn't say this term? Each one of those is a different search, different set of results. And some of the best people in my experience have been people that didn't look like the best people. And that's the problem. Some of the easiest to find people, and you hit on it, Hung, I say this at LinkedIn, all these you know, hundreds of thousands of LinkedIn recruiters, they're using LinkedIn recruiter. And like, you have the same database. So what's your differentiation? If you're running really basic searches, you're probably getting kind of the same people and you're leaving a lot of people behind. You know, you're just not being able to requery the database to pull out some of the best people, the people that other people simply can't find or they're so buried they'll never see them. And you know what, Scott, go ahead, Adam. I, I was just gonna ask another question because I'm noticing the, client, the, the time's running down a little bit and I've, I've got a really important question, I think, but carry, carry on, Tom, sorry. Uh, well, uh, one more point on this before you get to the question, because I'd love to hear it, Adam. Um, basically, um, it's a lot of it is inference, isn't it? Um, which which a machine is you're asking a machine to guess, um, which is extremely hard to do because the machine, at least as we currently have computer programming, is ultimately there uh, to obey our instructions. Yeah. Um, and this is this is the core of where our general artificial intelligence isn't there because it can't make those guesses as to what we want uh, we need to explicitly state it and instruct it to do those things um so until we get to a point where ai uh, can anticipate what it is that we're looking for um then we're still going to need to have skill sources with that type of investigative mindset yeah. um a final point i'd also like to make before we get to adam's question on this is that also if everyone's hammering the same candidates we actually degrade those candidates as quality yeah. people um, because Absolutely. they get literally um, uh, annoyed at the overwhelming recruiter contact that they start switching off. They, they become much harder to convert. They won't listen to our, uh, our messages. Uh, they won't respond. Uh, they become kind of dead candidates to us, even if they're still there because they've yep. already been totally mined out. Whereas the person who's never been spoken to, um, this yep. may, the person may be very ready to have a chat with you. Absolutely, um, yeah. Go, go ahead, Adam. Glenn, what's your what's your best advice when a sourcer comes to you and says, "Glenn, how how do I how do I hire better for di how, how do I source better for diversity?" I'm conscious that's a massive massive question. Well, yeah, it, it also depends on what type of diversity because I've actually worked with some people at companies that have dedicated you know diversity sourcing professionals. Um, it's something that I've well, it also depends on what you mean by better, right? If they have things that they're trying to achieve, it all goes back to figuring out what is it you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a more diverse candidate slate and you have your sourcers that are sourcing for the job, but then you also have your dedicated diversity sourcers and you don't have to have a dedicated team, but obviously some companies are big enough where they, they do or it's their, their, that's what they believe we need to have a dedicated function. Um, it all goes back to figuring out what is my goal. And it, it could be as simple as saying, we need to have uh, more diversity in the slate. And that could be gender, it could be race or ethnicity, it could be age, any of the diversity characteristics. And then they have to start breaking down, well, how do I find people uh, that fit those criteria? And I know some companies say, you shouldn't do that. Other companies are like, I can't do anything about diversity if you don't allow me to go proactively find these people and make, just make sure that I have a diverse representative slate. That's a problem. If, you're, if your candidate slates are non-representative, you can't just try to post on diversity job sites and say, I, I hope that the right people apply. That's, I think, ridiculous. Uh, but it does go back to that mentality of, okay, so 
and I, and I know that some people are aware of this, but years ago, if I'm trying to hire for more uh, female software engineers, like you have to start thinking, well, where can I find them? How can I identify them separately from non-female software engineers? Uh, and that's where some of the fun stuff on LinkedIn came in where I did like the whole first name search, which is not perfect, right? Uh, it was never meant to be perfect, but it actually works better than just running a non-search into the entire database. Um, and you can do the same thing with names. You can do it with groups, associations, uh, universities, but it, it's not about the answer. It's about the question. What am I trying to accomplish? And what is the best way to accomplish that? If you're looking for certain types of people, you have to figure out where are they going to be and how can I identify them? And for certain diversity characteristics, people are very sensitive and don't want to share that information. So it becomes a hundred times more difficult to potentially identify them, uh, which we have to respect. But you also have to respect a company that says we're dedicated to hiring more uh, diverse people because our talent pool is not representative. But I still think it's the underlying mechanism of saying, what's my goal? Where are those people? And how do I identify them specifically and then outreach to them? It's such a challenge because you can't be sitting in a team not filling any of your vacancies because you're spending all your time trying to create a diverse slate. But at the same time, so there's a real balance. There's got to be a real balance between getting your jobs filled and trying to achieve diversity. Yeah. Absolutely. I, think, I think on this note, it's basically going to be imperfect solutions, but let's give perfect effort to it um, and see what we can do. Um, uh, as I say, I don't think you can rely on advertising. You have to be proactive in terms of doing this. Um, that obviously then lays you open to stuff like, you know, discriminatory accusations and stuff like this, reverse racism. Or we've, we've heard these terms. Um, and you know, we have to be careful as recruiters because obviously it actually differs from uh, region to region in terms Absolutely. of what is legal or not. Um, you know, we know that UK is different laws to the many different in, within states in the US. I'm sure you have different laws also. Um, so you've got to also have that sort of compliance aspect to your, to your mindset as well. Uh, but I think sources have got a particular role to play uh, to help diversify pipeline for sure, um, because uh, you can't just rely on inbound uh, making it work. Um, it's got to be you got to you got to do additional effort and, and reach out. Final question, Glenn, before we let you go, because uh, I know this topic is actually really personal to you as well. I mean, we read the blog about it. Fantastic effort. This is about the hidden sort of aspects of diversity, particularly neuro atypical hiring and what have you. A topical that a uh, topic that has become important, I think, over the last several years or so. Thankfully, um, what are your thoughts on this? Like, how do we go about hiring a neuro? a diverse workforce, particularly when this may well be quite hidden um, uh, on a resume, for instance. Yeah, that's particularly challenging, uh, especially from a proactive um, perspective. Um, you know, some companies, I think Microsoft, without doing a little bit of research, I think they actually have a whole group that's focused on neurodiversity specifically. Um, I think that there's obviously communities that you can reach out to. There's actually some really, really cool individuals that I've connected with on Twitter that have identified themselves. You know, there are some folks that say, hey, I'm I'm neurodiverse, right? Or I have autism. Um, those folks I have found are incredibly helpful. And I think it actually ties back to something that we don't talk enough about of uh, with regard to sourcing is the human sourcing element, which is networking and referrals. You know, sometimes it's running a search and finding people. Sometimes it's talking to people and finding, you know, I'm interested in hiring more people like you. How can I do that? And I have found that for many different ways of approaching that challenge, that that's really the best way. You can do your online research. You can try to find people directly. But if you can, if you can tap into the right individuals who do self-identify, you can start identifying groups and also just even be networked. Uh, there are employers that are known to be neurodiverse friendly, and that's through word of mouth, through uh, networking. You know, it, it can be in person, but also social. So that's one way that I would say it's very important that you can leverage social media because, again, some people are identify, but they're kind of champions for uh, their cause for neurodiversity. And if you can be genuine in reaching out to those individuals and networking with them and and from your organization's point of view, uh, it really helps to be able to become known in that community as 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 a, as a friendly, a place that we want to to recruit and add more people like you in our organization. 
So actually it's beyond the search because like you said, it could be completely invisible. It may be almost impossible to identify just through keywords. Uh, that's where I would go to the next layer, which is working with other people. Yeah, and as you say, there are champions of, of these uh, in communities which may be a little bit more visible than the average, uh, and they're people who could potentially be really good sources uh, uh, to connect with, at least to learn how to do it uh, at the very least and, and build your strategies out from, from there. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, Glenn, uh, what a wonderful uh, uh, sort of episode. Great to have you on the show. Um, I'd love to actually get you back. I think there's loads of reasons why we could keep talking, Glenn. There's so many things we should, uh, we should, uh, we should debate. Um, so great to see you, you, uh, you're on the show and, and, and looking well and doing well. Um, the, um, that's about it for us, I think. Uh, so thank you, Glenn, Kathy, um, and Adam Gordon, uh, for joining me on the show. Thank you everyone for watching, uh, as well. It's been a pleasure seeing you all. Thank you everyone on LinkedIn, Facebook, Periscope, and on Crowdcast. Uh, we will be back next week, uh, with Charu Molotra and Uana, your Dachescu, I think I got your name right, Oana. We're talking about virtualization of onboarding. Going to be super interesting because everyone's had to do that. Uh, and Oana's actually done it from both sides because she's been basically recruiting for her team and actually got a new job all virtually and all uh, remotely. So something that really interesting for us to keep an eye on. So make sure you follow the channel, folks. I'll see you here next week on Friday. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you.